All right. It doesn't work. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yes, so, two important things at the beginning tonight. So, like important thing number one. Yeah. So, we come today, I would like uh, for all of you guys to turn in your uh, in ideas case. about the final project. But then you need a race. And so, it can be very short. I do not want a lot, but I want you to think a lot about it, okay? So, next Tuesday, uh, after class, uh, you should send me um, a one paragraph summary of what it is that you would like to do for your final project. And it can be as simple as, well, the input to my program is the following, the expected output of my program is the following, and the type of a method I want to implement and expand and generalize and make faster is a method based on the paper blah 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 blah, and my idea to make it better is the following idea. Okay? Something like that. So, what goes in, what comes out, should come out, and what is it that you want to implement based on what existing package and tools and software and algorithms and how you would like to make that better. And better can mean different things, right? More general, more specialized, optimized, parallelized, apply to something different, right? It has to be uh, something that goes beyond what is written in the latest paper about that particular type of method. And of course, by all means, I encourage you to relate your final project to your own research and right, you don't waste your time. Compliment. I will be very flexible uh, with respect to the topic. Um, so this is advanced visualization. Of course, it should be uh, a project that relates to making pictures, right? Visualizing something. But it is, if, it, if it is more along the lines of numerical algebra and doing some computing very efficiently, very effectively, uh, parallelizing certain things, making something very real, I mean, real time, right? And that it goes, really goes into the area of numerical and algebra, fine. Right? But show me that it relates somehow to allowing real-time interaction with uh, visualization, for example. Or I'm um, also open to, I mean, architecture-based, GPU-based, parallelization-based methods, okay? If there's some great algorithm out there, but no one really has figured out how to parallelize it very well with the data structures and the method, then that's, that's cool too, okay? Um, and of course, it, if it goes more in the direction of computer graphics, right, animation and making pictures of dinosaurs, whatever, right, dinosaurs with different material types and different surfaces and different subsurface scattering under the skin and all of that, fine, okay? But it has to have some kind of link back to right, visualization. But I want to be very broad. Um, <laughs> that is uh, number one. Number two is... Um, those of you guys who have not signed up yet for the uh, uh, demo, uh, there is still slots open, of course. And please now put uh, a time down there for the Thursday, for Thursday night. We will be doing the demos also on Thursday night. And some of you already claimed uh, Thursday, but we don't have times there yet. So again, on Thursday, we should start at 7.40, and then we go until, well, 8.30 or so, okay? So uh, if, if you are down there for Thursday, or you put put Thursday down next to your name, put the time down for Thursday between 7.40 and 8.30, okay? Okie doke. Um, lecture. I should start with a lecture. Um, next topic is very important topic. Scattered, scattered data approximation. So what is the general, the general context? The context is that uh, people or instruments perform measurements somewhere in an irregular way and you would like to reconstruct the pa particular the phenomenon or the particular geometry that has been sampled, that has been observed, that has been measured. So in the 2D case, you have an x-axis, a y-axis, and the function value, and maybe you have a bunch of observations that live at these scattered locations, so there is no structure anymore uh, to the location of these measurements. They are really randomly, randomly located. And at those sites, uh, so the little circle guys are called sites, usually, you have uh, dependent function values and I draw them in the f direction. 
And of course, for rendering, when you want to make a picture, you do not just want to show these sticks, but you would like to reconstruct the smooth function between these sticks. Right? That's the whole problem of scalar data approximation. So you have the measured or scanned or observed function values at these locations. And for rendering, of course, you would like to have something like this. And you make a picture of that, the Gros shaded surface, then you would like to be able to evaluate over this respective area where you have your samples. So this location would be a location xi, yi, and you have a dependent function value there, fi. So what's given? Given is just this set, uh, finite set of sample data, xi, yi, and the dependent function value, fi, and you have n of these guys. And what is wanted? One is this guy, this function f of x, y, huh? which I represent by this huh? curved creature. So wanted is a function function f that should initially only satisfy one condition, namely that when I evaluate this function f, it should reproduce the uh, uh, measurements fi at the sides xi yi function f such that st such that f when evaluated at the side reproduces that value that I'm given there that's all and I think I will just uh, walk us through the methods by starting with a very simple one dimensional Right? Curve example first, and then from the curve we can go to the surface example, and then once we understand the surface, then we really know how to do that for the volume data, right? Yeah, visualization, volume visualization, we really want to apply all this stuff really for volume data, right? Temperature field in this room, right? You want to do a volume rendering of uh, huh? the temperature in this room, but you only have uh, uh, 10 thermometers in, in this room, right? So 10 readings, that's not good enough, so you want to reconstruct the entire continuum. And you do that by, well, applying something like that. But this something has to be a good some, something, so that's why I talk about it. So we start with the 1D slash univariate case. Case. Okay. All right. In the univariate case, what does the situation look like? That we only have one dimension for the location of the sites and one direction for f. And we have these sticks, which are now randomly spaced. And I call these locations x1, xi, and the last one is xn. All right, so what, what is the problem? The problem is I would like to draw some kind of smooth curve or high resolution polyline, right, connecting these sticks. Mm. What's the general approach? The general problem is I need to evaluate this continuum function that I do no longer have or that I never had at this arbitrary value x. Okay, so when I need to evaluate at this location x, then I should combine all the measurements in some way. And the general principle is a principle that's very simple. Data that is very close to me should have high or low importance when I evaluate here. Data that is close to me should have high weight or low weight? High weight. And data that is very far away from me should have low weight, okay? So the weight, how to combine these observations, should be related to how close or how far the samples are away from me, me being at the location, me, I'm an I standing at the location where I need to estimate the value, right? So that's the whole principle. So being close, being far away relates to what measure? Distance, right? So if something is close to me, it should have high weight. So small distance <coughs> equals high weight. Something is far away from me, high distance value should have low weight, right? So that's the principle. So therefore, um, I should combine all the given measure measurements in such a way that I use distance in a reciprocal way. Huh? All right. So, the <coughs> general principle. 
data close to x should have high weight when estimating a value mating a function value fct value f for location x for location location slash site x so this general principle then translates into a simple formula and this formula obviously has to include distance and this was done by this, uh, I think, high school student at the time, or undergraduate student who invented that. I think high, uh, high school aged student who already was pursuing graduate studies at the age of 16 in geology. And so this is called Shepherd's Method. You can look him up. Shepherd's Method. And there will be a, a variety of them. And I call the first one S1. So if there is a shepherd method S1, there will be an S2 and an S3 and S4 and so forth. S2, uh, S1 of x, will do the following. Um, whenever I evaluate this shepherd function at one of the given sites, then I should reproduce the values there, right? at the sides, at the circles, I should be able to get the bullets back. Okay, so that's the first condition I write down. It should reproduce if I, if uh, x is one of the sides, if x is one of the xi's. And otherwise, it should be a combination of all the values in such a way that those close to me have high weight and those far away from me have low weight using the distance at the, at the immediate weight. When I actually write this down, what this means, it means that I combine, combining is summing up from 1 to n, I combine all the observations fi, and I use uh, weights that are uh, the inverses of distances, 1 over di, divided by the sum of all the weights, 1 of di. Otherwise, Now I just need to say what the di is. The di is the distance function, the distance of a site to a particular evaluation location, where, where the distance di is di of x, and so distance is square yeah. root of x minus xi squared. Okay. What type of a function do you get? Will the function that you get when you program this look good, or will it look bad? I already said there is an S1, there is an S2, there is an S3, there is an S15. So S1 is probably pretty bad. Okay. Otherwise, there would only be an S. All right. So, okay, it will interpolate here, but otherwise, it looks pretty ugly. It could look like that. Okay, it does the job, namely going through the points, but that's about it. The way I've drawn it, you see that there are slope discontinuities. It is not smooth, right? Mm -hmm. So it is just what is said to be C zero continuous. But but the resulting uh, function S one has slope discontinuities, and gradient discontinuities later on. Slope discontinuities, uh, slope discontinuities, discontinuities, continuities at the xi sides. So this is bad. There's a simple fix to that.
we use the square of the distance d i squared of x instead of d i. So you get a new shepherd, shepherd 2 equals. All right, so at least I should tell you how you actually prove this, right? The general idea. How do you prove that indeed this thing has different slopes when you approach the side xi from the left and from the right? How do you prove that? That the slope really disagrees approaching this particular location from two different sides? You do the limit, right? Huh? You actually evaluate this formula for xi minus an epsilon, and then let, it, let epsilon go to 0, right? And you approach xi from xi plus epsilon, and let's ep let epsilon go to 0. And then you will see that you get two different slopes. Hmm? So uh, same with here. Here, I, I will claim that this thing has, is slope continuous. Again, how do you prove that? Again, by making sure that in the limit process that the slopes agree at the sides. Hmm? And that's how you will see it in the papers. So S2 looks just the same, except that we say, interpolate the given datum fi if I am at a location xi or otherwise combine combining means computing the sum of all the values sum of all the values fi weighted inversely proportional to the square of the distances 1 over di squared divided by the sum of all these weights 1 over di squared Otherwise, okay, so di, where di, is, di squared is what? Well, it's just the square of that, so the square root goes away. Where uh, di squared of x is just x minus xi squared. Okay, now you get a better function. What do I mean by better? Well, at least the slopes are continuous at the sides. But it will look like this. And you tell me whether that is cool or not. OK. These are the sides. Circle, 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 circle. These are the values. And since I have computed these things right for many decades, I know how they look like, and they always have a zero slope okay, at the sides. Meaning, whenever you evaluate this function, S2 of x, at any of the sides, xi, and you differentiate that, then you always get the slope of zero. Is this nice or not? You have plateaus everywhere, right? So the function actually will look even worse. It will look like this. <coughs> okay, that's roughly the nature of the beast. Is this nice? It solves the problem. Maybe it's nicer than this. Probably is, in some sense. But still, we don't like this fact that whenever I am at one of the sticks, I have a zero derivative. Why should I? Right, my IC is a much smoother curve going through there. All right, if there is S2, there is also. Sir? Tell me your name. I can, there's an S3, too, I, I guess. Um, before we move on, though, uh, can you put what the actual uh, limits on the sum are in the denominator? Or which one? I can't remember which one is which. I have from 1 to n. So, because I, I can't really tell what the difference is between the sum on the top and the sum on the bottom. On the top, I, I multiply all the given function values by this distance. By there. Oh, by there, fi. Okay, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Okay, it's the distance expression is a weight for the function value. Okay, I come back to the meaning of such formulas. They are convex combinations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have these flat spots or plateaus, and they are not nice. Hmm? So we have uh, these undesirable flat spots, flat spots or plateaus.
Okay. Now, how can I fix that? This is all I have. I have five sides, and that's it. I don't have anything more. I have five sides and five sticks. And my method is always taking the stuff that I have, namely these, these data, the dependent data, and combining them in this way. We already talked about the first assignment, right? Besides just prescribing the value, the given value, we can also prescribe what? This one should look like this, right? This one should look like this, and this one should look like that. And here we should have a slope like that, okay? A gradient. Okay, so we have, an, we have an oracle here, right? Oracle is a modern term, right? People like to use that, I guess. So we have a method here that has some data which are being combined. Instead of just combining function values, we can combine function values plus slopes. Hmm? You blend things. Right? You are averaging things. All right. So instead of just prescribing uh, the function value, we now will prescribe a line at each side. The line is not given to us right, in the beginning. In the beginning, we are only given the function value. So we need to worry about, again, computing the estimates right, for those lines. But assume that we have these good estimates. Then we want to interpolate to those um, first degree approximations. So at each side, we now actually have a line. We will be averaging or blending lines together to get a better look. Um, S3 of x uh, um, besides, besides uh, fi values assume That good, good uh, slope slopes uh, f i prime f i prime values uh, are also known are also known known semicolon and then we will just uh, combine line equations or lines. Uh, from each side, then generalize generalize method method to combine to combine combine line equations or first degree Taylor approximation that decides to combine to combine line equations line equations. Um, uh, associated with the sides, with sides. Okay, so the picture now looks as follows. We have our line, we have our function direction f, x, uh, our sides, something like that. And we assume that we also have meaningful derivatives at these locations. And our i is always a good judge to see what good derivatives are. Right? At the beginning, it should start like this. Here, it should look like this. Here, it should look like this. Here, it should look like that. And here, it should look like that. Right? Somewhat like that. And the resulting function we would like to get should look like this. It should interpolate the function value as well as the slopes. Okay. So it's better. All right, so this is an xi. This is the function value fi. And this guy would be the derivative fi prime. Okay, so the formula now will blend line equations. Right? Now we have a little Taylor approximation of the function 
at every side, and we will blend or combine, average all these line equations together. And so the formula S3 of x looks as follows. We have to understand what a, a single datum now is. A datum is now the definition of the line. So we have an fi, which no longer just an fi, but it's a line equation, so it's an fi of x. And fi of x is the value there, the function value fi, plus the derivative there, fi prime, times x minus xi. Right, that's the line equation uh, passing through that passing through that value fi, having slope fi prime. When you differentiate this guy with respect to x, well, the, di the differential is fi prime. Hmm? And the shift is huh, x minus xi plus x minus huh? All right, so again, it is fi. If x is an xi side, or otherwise, it will be a combination, sum from 1 to n, 1 over di squared, times, now these are fi depending on x, these are the line equations, fi of x divided by the sum of all weights, 1 over di squared, i from 1 to n. And the important part is that this is now functions that we are actually blending together, not just function values. All right, now that we have that, we have to talk about getting these derivatives, right? For the first assignment, it was easy, because the first assignment was just working on a Cartesian grids, right? Everything is just always one half, right minus left. In all the papers, it's always one half, right minus left. That's the differential, right? It only works for Cartesian meshes. So we have to do this for this setting. And if we understand it for the 1D case, then, well, usually one can also understand it easily for the 2D case and 3D case. Let's do that. So this is just a little note. Since the derivatives, the slopes at the sides are not given to us, we need to compute them fast and in a meaningful way. So this is just note or remark. Note, we need to compute uh, good fi prime values at the sides. Uh, computation of good, good uh, um, fi prime, i.e. Uh, slope, slope values. How do we do that? Okay. How do we get good slopes? At this at this point here, what kind of slope do we want? Do we want this zero slope? No? Do we want this slope? What slope do you want here? This one? Tell me when the slope is good. No good slopes? Not at all? Your eye tells you what a good slope is, right? So we only want to understand what one can do if one has just the local neighborhood to consider, okay? So this is a very simple way of looking at it. So here is the side xi. Uh, here is xi plus 1. Here is an xi minus 1. Here are the values that we are given, and only that. And we want to get a slope there. How do we get a good slope there? Is this a good slope? No? Is this a, this slope is better, right? It's this slope. Right? No? Okay. So this is a meaningful slope, that's a meaningful slope, but either one isn't really good. It would be better. 
So it's somehow related to the slope coming from the left and the slope coming to the right, if you just consider this particular slope. Hmm? What about this? I can also do this, right? And differentiate that parabola. Okay. Or what about this? Do that too, right? So there's different ways to think about that. Um, I will just talk about one. But I want to tell you that there are many ways of getting good slopes. So take this in, okay? Um, this is a center point, and of course it has a left neighbor and a right neighbor. So the slope here in the middle should be an average between this one, no? the line from the left, and the line from the right. You can combine these in some way. No? Should it be one half of that slope plus one half of that slope? Not really, because we don't really have the delta, right? the same spacing here. There's an arbitrary spacing. You know? But you can think of it that way. Well, there's some line like this connecting this. And there's another line there. And somehow you can combine these two slopes in such a way that a good slope estimate in the middle comes out. That's one way of thinking about it. The other way to think about it is you have a quadratic polynomial, a parabola, that goes through three points. Right? A parabola is always a plus bx plus cx squared. Right? Hmm? You can do that. Three values, one parabola. Or then there's something that I will talk about, because it's, in a sense, the cheapest you compute what is called a least squares line. There's a line that is the best possible approximation to three values. Hmm? So there's one unique line that is the best I can construct getting close to these three data, never really interpolating them, but getting very close to them, as close as possible. And then I can look at the slope of this line and say, that slope of that line is the slope that I use for that point in the middle. Okay. So there are many ways, many possibilities and I'll just give you one. One is uh, construction of the least squares line. Um, determine, determine the best possible best possible best possible uh, line L this is that line best possible line L L approximating the three function values with minimal error uh, approximating approximating the three function values three FCT values fi minus 1, fi, fi plus 1, with minimal error. So with minimal error, that includes something is really best here, right? It's minimal error. Okay, I'll continue that here. <laughs> xi minus one, xi, xi plus one. fi minus 1, fi, fi plus 1. And you believe me that there is one best line that is as close as possible to all three data, right? And your eye sees that line, the, the line is this one. It's unique. There's only one line that, that minimizes these three differences. Okay. 
so L is a, is a line that depends on x. And a line is defined by two points, right? So here we have three data, therefore it can only approximate, and we want to get the best line. So we write down the conditions anyway, the conditions to interpret the three, which it cannot really do, and then we minimize the errors. Okay. Um, three interpolation conditions. Interpolation conditions for for the line line L of X which is of the form say A plus B times X right three conditions conditions are I can write this down as a matrix my unknowns are the coefficients A and B and they should the line should interpret three values which it cannot but it should interpolate fi minus 1 and fi and fi plus 1. Since, it's, since it cannot interpolate, it should approximate as best as possible these three values. And so now I plug the different sides into that equation for x. So it is 1 times a plus uh, x minus one, uh, xi minus 1 times b equals fi minus 1. Then I have a plus b times xi equals fi, and then I have the last equation, 1 times a plus xi plus 1 times b equals fi plus 1. Hmm? So this is an overdetermined system. I have three equations for only two unknowns. So this is some kind of matrix M times a coefficient vector a equals some vector of function values f, right? That is the system you have to solve, and it's overdetermined. So and now you do what is called the least square step. You solve the corresponding least square system. Solve, solve least squares problem. Squares problem. And after many, many transformations, I tell you where this comes from. You actually just solve m transpose m t times m times a equals m transpose times f. And so this little t symbol is just the transpose of this matrix, right? Flipping rows and columns. t uh, means the transpose. Transpose. OK. How do we get this? We actually write down the expression uh, for the differences between the actual value on the line and the value at those sites. And you express these errors, the sum of these errors, the sum of these errors squared as a function of the unknowns a and b. Uh, then you have a function in two variables a and b, and you would like that function, the error function, summing up the squares of these differences, to be minimal. So then you have that function. In order to, for a function to be minimal, you have to differentiate it with respect to its well, a, a and b direction. And you have uh, the necessary condition for the gradient there to be 0. Blah, 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 and ultimately, you end up with this equation that solves it. Okay? So this comes from normal equations. Normal, normal equations. But this is very fast. Huh? So here now you have, this is a, a 3 by 2. So this is a 2 by 3. Ultimately, when you multiply them, it's a 2 by 2 matrix, right? 2 by 2 matrix times the two unknowns equals a vector of 2, right? Entries on the right hand side. So it's a 2 by 2 problem, no big deal. Um, the only expensive part is to multiply the uh, 3 by 2 matrix with the 2 by 3. That's it. But that's not expensive either. And you get ultimately the slope. So therefore, what do you get out of it? This guy has a particular <coughs> slope there, right? This is what I will use as a derivative at this side, right? And that is just this line equation uh, differentiated at xi. But well, this line has the same slope everywhere, so it's just this coefficient b, right? The only thing that I'm after is b. I only have to solve this thing really for b. I only want the slope, huh? just the slope. I just want that b slope of that line. 
So this is P L prime at x i is P because the slope of the entire line is B everywhere. And this is the end of the remark or the end of the note. Does it all make sense so far? Make sense? OK. All right. Now we understand everything for the 1D case. Then we can go to the 2D case, and we can go to the 3D case. One question in the meantime I want to throw in there is this whole method of averaging all these function values efficient and fast or not? What is the expensive part in doing all of this? Huh? This one. Here we have it. What is the expensive part to compute this value, S3? The expensive part is the sum. Is the sum a small sum, or is it a big sum? I have 10 temperature readings in this room. It's a small sum. Okay, But I have, a, say, a terrain, a height field, measured with laser scans. Lasers can produce a lot of samples in a matter of a femtosecond, right? So this n can be very big. When this n is, say, above a million, then even mm, the latest GPUs get slowed down. OK, so this is expensive. So I just want to mention that. OK, so therefore these methods are also called global. They consider everything. Huh? For example, if I want to reconstruct the temperature field, right, in this layer that is one kilometer up from the ground to mm, one, one, one kilometer up, and I have temperature readings all over the world, and I have 10 billion of those temperature readings, and I want to reconstruct using this global N all 10 million readings or whatever, then it's expensive, right? So you want to, well, does the temperature reading in Europe actually have an influence on the temperature reading here? Probably not. Okay, so therefore, do you always have to use all 10 million? No. The, the trick is how to use a good N, right? A local N. All right, so that was that. So now we talked about the 1D case. After the 1D comes the 2D, right? 2D or the bivariate case. Bivariate case. What changes? Nothing. Nothing changes. I don't even need to put anything on the board, right? Or should I? I should, right? But nothing much changes except that the definition of a site changes. A site is no longer just an x, but it's an xy. It's an x1, x2, huh? two variables. Does it change when we go from 2D to 3D? No, except that a site is no longer just an x, but it's an x, y, z. But the whole apparatus, the whole way to average and combine the values, the temperature readings in this room is the same. Mm -hmm. All right, nevertheless, let's do it. So a simple illustration in 2D, I would have some readings in the plane can think of these as maybe uh, height values, terrain, terrain data, scanned with a laser scanner, giving you several millions and millions of points. Um, so again, the interesting part is that these locations are random. <coughs> I have my xi, yi, and I have an fi. And again, what I want is for evaluation of our rendering surfaces, I would like to have a nice, beautiful shaded surface there, happily grow shaded with uh, little quadrilaterals, and applying a lighting model, not just showing the sticks. So, given is now the set of xi, yi, fi, i from 1 to n. And wanted, well, the wanted was already on the board. I had this already, right? But, 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 that was at the beginning. I motivated the whole thing with this particular picture anyway. So this picture is kind of like at the center of everything. The 2D setting is a little bit more complicated, a little bit more difficult, right? From the 1D case, 
Why is it? It's the rearrangement of the points, the arrangement of the sites. Right? Here in, in the 1D case, at least you have this notion of when I'm here, this guy has a left neighbor and this guy has a right neighbor, right? This is lost now. You see that? Nothing is that easy anymore. So it's becoming a little bit more general, more complicated, right? Random sites on the line, yes, but still there's an order, a natural order, right? The smallest site value, x1, x1 it's indexed in such a way that x1 is the smallest x, that xn is the largest of all x's. Huh? So there's a natural order in there, from left to right, from smallest to largest. You cannot do that here, right? Which point is the smallest? There is no inherent ordering from this is point 1, this is point n. Point 1 is the one that is measured first, and point n is the one that is measured last. Huh? I could also me measure these guys coming from the right and going down. I could say this is x1 and this is xn. But you see that this makes it more, problem more problematic. OK, so let's just write down what S2 is. For example, what is S2 in this case? For example, S2 in this case looks like what? Shepard 2. It is now a function depending on x and y which is what, again, it should reproduce the fi value if a tuple xy is one of the sides xi, yi, and otherwise it's a combination of all the sticks, all the data that I'm given. Otherwise it's a combination sum i from 1 to n dividing by all the distances i from 1 to n, the weights are 1 over distances di squared times just the function values for s2 divided by the sum of all weights di squared. Okay. Otherwise, okay. What do I have to say? I have to say what the di squared values are. Where in this case, where now di squared is now di squared of x and y which is uh, x minus xi squared plus y minus yi squared. Otherwise, everything is the same, except that now the number of variables grows and grows and grows and grows. That's it. S2 is already smooth. Okay, but what would it look like? What, what did S2 look like in the 1D case? Don't copy this. This is just kind of right in our memory bank. We are remembering what S2 looked like in 1D. It looked like this. It had these plateaus all over the place, right? So if in 1D it produces these types of plateaus, what will it do in this case, in the 2D setting? It will produce. happy plateau regions at all the sites. So it will look like the, uh, in a sense, like Monument Valley. Huh? Monument Valley, you have also the rocks, and they're flat, right? It will look like that. Right? There's these little rocks coming out at the function value, and then it's flat. And then the immediate neighborhood has the same value. We don't like that. Shoot. I have a question about the, um, the sub-value i. Should mm -hmm. it be i comma j, since we're doing x, no. y? No. It's i? We, we are just still calling. The first one, point one, and the last one, x n y n. We just use one index. These, these are just the independent creatures, right? First point, second point, third point, nth point. Okay. It's the number of dimensions x y that has gone up, but in terms of indexing or numbering the uh, elements, they are still from one to n. Um, all right, so there are plateaus. We don't like that. How did we cure that in the in the 1D case? What did we do? We prescribed um, slopes. And in the 2D case, what do we prescribe? Tangent planes, planes, right? Osculating planes, touching planes, gradients, gradient behavior, slope behavior in x direction and y direction, right? All right. So this one will have plateaus 
and we don't like that, so therefore one has to worry about an S3 which considers entire linear functionals uh, being interpolated, linear Taylor expansions. Um, but S2 of xy has flat spots flat spots which are undesirable unless you do an animation that should look like Monument Valley and you want flat spots, right? Uh, which are undesirable therefore therefore use S3 okay all right so for S3 as I said now we need something in addition to the original sticks um, so these are our locations and our height values, our function values. And this doesn't suffice, but we also prescribe the derivative behavior there with a plane. You know? Just have a little plane there that you can tilt around you know, and change its, you know, its normal. And well, there is maybe a best one, or a good one. Not the best one, a good one. So we prescribe a little happy tangent plane here which has a particular slope in x and in y. And again, there we will need to talk about the trick how to get a good one. So, we have a first degree Taylor, Taylor expansion at this particular site. The site here is xi, yi. So then this guy is function value fi. And I have two gradient components, the derivative fix and fiy um, uh, a local local uh, linear polynomial nomial um, is again an L, L for linear, L of xy well, this, this plane or this linear polynomial lives everywhere, right? And that we blend them all together, right? These little tangent planes define a linear polynomial for all the sticks, and ultimately I will uh, merge them, combine them, weight them, average them, and then an, uh, an, uh, an Li of xy will be, well, fi plus fix times x minus xi plus the gradient or the derivative in y direction at side i, y minus yi. So this is times. Okay. So this means that the gradient, the gradient, gradient, grad uh, of li is indeed uh, fx at location i and fy at location i. Uh, when you differentiate this expression with respect to x, then you get this value. Hmm? When you differentiate this expression with respect to y, you get that fact. Hmm? And those are the two components of the gradient of that function. Okay. So now we assume that we have these happy uh, linear polynomials, these happy planes of both sides. Now we can talk about S3, and I can write it down. And then we have to talk about how to compute the polynomials, right? Because that is a little bit more complicated than uh, the 1D case. Okay. Therefore, we now have our S3 for the bivariate setting to approximate something over the plane. In S3, we'll reproduce a measurement, fi, if the site 
location, the tuple, is one of the sites x i y i, or otherwise it will blend something. Blending is summing up or integrating, and it sums what? It sums linear polynomials. It is summing linear polynomials l i of x y's, which are weighted by the distance is squared d i squared over all n, from i from 1 to n, i from 1 to n, 1 over di squared. Otherwise. This is, uh, in a sense, just the combination, combination for a blending, blending, blending of uh, linear Taylor expansions at all the sides of linear, linear Taylor, Taylor expansions. Uh, known at all sides, known uh, at all sides. That's one way of thinking about it. Okay, but I didn't really say how we get these happy uh, planes, right? How do we get the, a good plane? How did we do it in 1D, and how can we do it in 2D? All right. So now you need to help me, OK? Be creative and tell me how you would tackle that. Don't copy this. This is just to remember. In 1D, I said, well, Bernd, you have three sticks. And I want to use, as a, as a slope here, the slope that is the slope of the best possible line approximating these three data, right? So the best line here might be this one, so I copy that slope over to use it as a slope for that middle point. But again, this whole thinking is based on the notion of central point. Central point is the left and the right neighbor, right? Here in this setting, there's no such thing as a left neighbor, a right neighbor, a front neighbor, a back neighbor. There's no mesh, there's no grid, there's no order. Huh? Something is point one, this is point one, this is point two, this is point three, this is point four. It's random, it's scattered. How can we still do something like that? Pause, pause. One minute thinking break. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. If I just wanted uh, a line equation, uh, a plane equation, how many data do I need to define a plane in three-dimensional space, a linear polynomial? Three, right? Three would be good enough. So therefore, I could say, um, uh, if I'm at a particular site, use that site plus two others to define a triangle in space. And the triangle has obviously a slope because it's a plane equation, right? A triangle is a plane. You can do that. Is that good enough? Should I use three points? Should I use ten points? Jennifer? Which, which points do I pick? The I should pick closest ones. Close ones. Close ones is good. But how many? How many of those closest ones should I pick? Just three? Fifty? Until using more doesn't make a difference anymore, right? So in the 1D case, I use just three, right? Three points, three sticks to get a good line. I could also use five, right, to get a good line. There's no, no restriction on that. At some point, it doesn't make a difference anyway. And at some point, the sticks are too far away, and I really should not consider them because they are far away, right? So this is a straight off. You want to have a local scheme which only considers local stuff because the stuff far away shouldn't have an influence, should not have an influence, versus, well, if I just stay too narrowly, right, focused, that is maybe not good either, because I should see a little bit further than just beyond this room. I should see one room, two rooms, something, right? 
So it's an experimental parameter. There's no good answer for that. Therefore, people use K and N. K and N stands for? K nearest neighbors. K nearest neighbors. Right? So they use K nearest neighbor graphs, whatever these complicated terms are. So, um, so this is now how to estimate. Right? This is just an estimation. Estimate. Um, uh, it's really estimating gradients, right? Gradients, gradients, and the gradients are these little vectors, the f x i, f y i, uh, for the sides, for sides uh, x i, y i. Right? So the index i appears up here in the uh, superscript. I shouldn't disturb you because I use the lower subscript as to, to indicate differentiation with respect to x and with respect to y. Okay. All right, so how can we do that? Okay. So here's my uh, site for which I need an estimate. And I consider, say, k equals 6 for whatever. 6 is a good number, right? You like the number 6? I like the number 6. I think it's a very good number. So there's a side in the middle, and it's surrounded by, well, there are five of all the other points, which are the five closest ones. Huh? Hopefully, they are distributed like that. There's no guarantee. The five closest ones could all be lying on a line to one side, OK? That's ugly, too. So anyway, so we have these are the five closest ones. I just indicate that. There's no real connectivity. Again, there's, just, there's no mesh. There's no grid, right? These are the, um, use the big guy plus 5, which is hmm, uh, plus 5 nearest neighbors. Uh, nearest, nearest neighbors. Neighbors. Okay. So this is a 5 and 6 and n, if you count the big guy in the middle as well, right? Plus 5. Hmm, the smaller guys in its neighborhood. So here we have the sticks. We have the function values here. And they're probably, uh, in the analog way to the 1D case, there's probably a plane, right? There's probably a plane that is the best possible plane that I can place there that has minimal distance to all these sticks. There's no plane that passes through all these points. Six points not possible because three points determine uniquely a plane, right? But there's one plane that is the best plane. And I want to get that best plane and then use its slope behavior in x and y to specify the slope at this guy, at this location, right? That's where I need the slope. That's what I want. So I do a local indexing and I call the guy in the middle function value one. I call the guy here. F2, F3, F4, this is just the local numbering. These are six selected ones from the entire set of given data. And they are just a subset in this local neighborhood. Uh, so this is function value 6. And now this particular linear polynomial has a certain form, L, I of x, y. If it's linear, well, it will have the following form. It is just an a plus a b times x plus a c times y. That's all there is to a linear polynomial, right, in two variables. Okay. And now I would like this linear polynomial to approximate these six sticks. And I write this down. Um, here, six um, uh, equations. And again, I always like to write things down in matrix notation. So there is some kind of matrix. And the unknown vector are the, is a coefficient vector, the unknown ABC vector, ABC, times, on the right-hand side, I want to approximate, ideally interpolate, but not quite, the sticks. And locally, I have six of those, F1 up to F6. And now I just plug the different uh, locations. This, for example, would be 
location x1, y1, I plug all the locations, the side information, into this expression and want to approximate an f value. So the first one would be 1 times a plus x1 times b plus um, y1 times c equals f1. And then I have six of those equations. The last equation is 1 times a plus x6 uh, times uh, b plus y6 times c equals f6. Again, this is overdetermined. I have only three unknowns, a, b, c, and I have six equations, so I have to use this least squares trick. So this is a matrix M times, call this uh, the a vector again of unknowns, equals f. That's the overdetermined system, and you solve it uh, with the least squares step. Solve the squares, these squares. Step, and you will solve m transpose times m times unknown coefficient vector abc equals m transpose times the function value vector. This is still not too bad because when you multiply this out, you just have a 3 by 3 system, okay? A 3 by 3 matrix to invert. Not, not a big deal. And this makes us very happy. All right. So again, this was just a note or a remark. How do we get good uh, tangent planes? All right. What should I talk about? I think I should go to the 3D case right away. And I should talk a little bit about uh, the efficiency of all of this, right? Uh, 3D case. That's the case that really interests us. 3D or trivariate case. So in that case, I can no longer draw pictures of it, except the pictures of the domain. So in this case, our domain is already xyz space, xyz. And the function direction comes out of the board and goes in some direction. And my data live in some kind of uh, bounding cube, say. And we have our sites happily living in this box. Temperature readings, salinity readings, pollution readings, whatever it might be. So here we have given um, a set of tuples xi, yi, zi. And again, it's just one index, right? All these points are just numbered from 1 to n, even though they live in 3D space, x, y, z. And a dependent uh, f value. And we have, again, n of those, i from 1 to n. And so without any further ado, we can directly write down what S2 is. S2 is Shepard. 2, depending now on three variables, spatial variables, x, y, z. And again, what do we have at one of those tuples? At one of these tuples we have, well, this is just a location. <coughs> we have the dependent function value there, an fi value. And we want to reproduce it when we evaluate at that site. It is fi. If x, y, z coincides with one of the original sites, x, i, y, i, z, i. And otherwise, it should be a combination, uh, a mixture of all those readings or observations 
uh, and that is again the same. We mix all i from 1 to n. We mix them using weights, which are the distances squared. Sum of all the distances squared, reciprocal i 1 to n, 1 over d i squared. And we mix the function values. And what is the distance where the distance i squared is now x minus xi squared plus y minus yi squared plus z minus zi squared. If there's an S2, there's also an S3, right? Should I talk about it? No, because at this point, I have to trust that you can do that yourselves. I will not talk about it. I will stay away from that. But we can reflect on it jointly, right? In the three-dimensional case, you also will have plateau regions. If this S2 thing is producing plateaus for a volumetric data set, they would manifest themselves <laughs> as what type of features in a volume rendering, okay? What is this? These, this is a subset of, the skull, of a skull data set, right? You just take a big skull data set, 256 by 256 by 256, and you just select 1,000 points randomly, right? Just take 1,000 points randomly from your originally nice Cartesian grid, and then you have a random point set, a scattered data point set, and then if, as if you apply S2 to it, I tell you S2 produces flat spots. So when you do a volume rendering, then you would see a flat spot around each side. In a volume rendering, how should that manifest itself? You should see blobs of nearly constant color, right? Right? Flat spots are zero gradient. Right? So there's hardly any change in color probably, right? Okay, so these, these, uh, the sites where you are sampling or where you have observations would stand out as little blobs, as little plateaus, I mean four-dimensional plateaus, but you would see them. You don't like it, therefore you need to do S3. S3, S3 of X, Y, Z is bam, 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 and bam, bam, bam. I don't need to put this on the board, right? You know the formula. It's so only now the additional variable is the z, right? The z variable that comes into the pick, into play. That's all. But you need, what do you need to worry about in order to do, to play the S3 game? You need derivatives. You need gradients, right? But again, I don't have to tell you that because the setting in 3D is uh, analogous to the setting here, right? You just find six points, huh? five points around a point in the middle, you set up a linear polynomial, now it will be an A plus B, X plus C, Y plus C, Z, and you do the same machinery, right? Same thing. So I trust that you see that. Um, need to uh, compute, <coughs> compute uh, least squares these squares, squares, uh, linear, linear polynomials, polynomials, and they will be of the form for each side, L, uh, I, you have a linear polynomial L, which will be of the form a constant plus a B times first variable plus a C times second variable plus a D times third variable, okay? And for there, again, you will have, in symbolic form, you will have um, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 one, two, three, four, times the unknown coefficient vector, A, B, C, D, to approximate all the values that you have in the local neighborhood. That will be the initial setup of your system, and then you do the least square step. Use the transpose of that matrix and solve it, just that on the other side. Okay? Bum, bum, bum. 
All right, now the real beauty is if I can do this for x, for x and y, for x, y, and z, then I can also do it for many, many more variables, right? Particularly, what, which is the next meaningful variable in scientific visualization? x, y, z, and time, right? So you can also do this for time dependent fields, right? Which is the next generalization? Okay. Um, okay. Should just talk about, uh, or let's think about the issue of uh, time. Are these methods expensive or are they cheap? What is the particular setting? I would like to use this in the setting of, for example, having real-time readings of the temperature in Lake Tahoe, right? Sensors are getting very small and very cheap, so I can easily throw 10,000, 100,000 sensors into a lake. Huh? Anywhere, I can throw all these cheap sensors anywhere, they record something, right? And I want to make a volume rendering, a cool picture of this actually time-dependent phenomenon, right? Temperature in the Lake Tahoe changing over time. If I use this machinery straightforward, and I have a million readings, and I want to produce a nice real-time rendering, a real-time rendering would produce at least 24 frames for left eye and 24 frames for right eye, right, to do it in stereo and see it in real time. And the sensors can produce that. So can I reconstruct so quickly with this? Probably not, because you as a scientist in the field only have a little laptop, right? Maybe with one cool GPU and uh, that's it. So you have to speed this up. How can you speed this up? Tell me your name again. William. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble remembering this, but is, is that equation over there? Can you use convolution to speed that up? Um, no. Okay. No. All right, it reminded me of something we used convolution to speed up in the past, so I thought I would ask then. No. But this goes in another direction, convolution, and where do I need more samples, and where is this, where can I use sparser and higher resolution? If the lake temperature is nearly constant in a certain area, I don't need so many sensors, and don't, I don't need so many readings. It's another way to kind of like keep this N down. It has to do with this N. I want to keep the N down, right? Uh, this big sum that I have to compute, and these distances there, these x minus x i squared, the squaring operation, the multiplication and the divisions are expensive. That's the stuff that's expensive. Uh, no, I cannot do anything with convolutions or transforms or Fourier stuff or Laplace stuff here directly. No, I don't see that. Um, we, keep, we have to keep end on. Okay. So, again, if I'm standing here in this corner and I want to approximate the temperature field here, say, in, in a box that is 2 by 2 by 2 meters around me, huh? then do I need to consider the temperature readings back there in the corner? Maybe I should, but I don't want to because it's too expensive. Right? So therefore, I will only consider the temperature readings in this 2 by 2 by 2 meter box around me. Okay? But then when I move, and I move here, then I have to use a 2 by 2 by 2 meter cubed box around me here to do reconstruction in this particular box, right? So that is one way to make it more efficient. Whenever you are evaluating your domain, your volumetric domain, um, you only consider the sites or the original data that are in that box where you are evaluating to produce an estimate. When, when this box where you evaluate moves around, you consider always changing data sites and data values, right? The question is, what is the speed up? Um, into how many uh, smaller boxes do you have to divide this room? Eight boxes? 64 boxes? 256 boxes, at what point shouldn't you be using smaller boxes anymore because you, it becomes too local, the approximation, and deteriorates, right? Probably should not be, the boxes shouldn't be too small because then the quality of the reconstruction isn't good enough. So there's a trade-off between the speed and the quality of reconstruction. What are the best numbers? The best numbers depend on the particular phenomenon and uh, various other parameters that I didn't even talk about. 
But again, the important thing is that you would like to use this in a real-time setting. Right? The real-time setting is someone has a very cheap, huge sensor network deployed out there and needs to be able to produce these types of the images resulting from S3 of XYZ in real time, in stereo, with 30 frames per eye, okay? on a very low-end, cheap laptop that you actually can carry with you in the field. You see that relationship there too, right? It has to be portable. So, um, and again, this is for your next assignment, how to speed these things up and still get a good picture at very, very good speed. Many things are, of course, trivially parallelizable, right? Once you know how you can cut, cut this room into octants, when every the computations are the same in each octant, right? You can trivially parallelize it. So. Okie doke. Everyone signed up for project one demos? Anyone still needs to sign up? Okay. All right. So we have demos tonight, and we have demos Thursday night. And then after Thursday night's demos, we will see where we are. Okay? All right. Thank you. Everyone stay in this room. We will have demos here, okay? And everyone is invited to stay. <laughs>